Hello, and welcome to day two of Manifest Minifest, round two, a short play festival by New Manifest Theater. I am Simone Alexander, the producing artistic director of New Manifest and the moderator for this festival. I'd like to start by thanking our wonderful sponsor, Six Square Austin's Black Cultural District, for helping us make this event free this year. I'd also like to thank all of our playwrights, panelists, actors, directors, and ensemble members who helped make this festival happen this year, as well as the Austin Community College interns who are providing ASL interpretation for this event. A little bit about our festival, Manifest Manifest was created with the idea of collaboration as well as showcasing our amazing ensemble of artists. This year, due to the pandemic, we decided to pivot to offer the show virtually and also to include artist workshops for our community. Obviously going virtual has its own ups and downs. So we apologize in advance for any technical issues that might pop up and hope you'll be patient with us as we pray to the internet gods. Today, we have our early producing workshop with Ivan Eve Devery, the artistic director of the Parsnip Ship podcast, and Rudy Ramirez, an associate artistic director of the Vortex here in Austin, Texas, as well as the founding director of Avante Theater Project, who produced the Future X Festival. I'm so glad to have these amazing artists on our panel today. So I'd like to go ahead and bring Ivan and Rudy in. I'll pop back up towards the end of the festival um, workshop portion to do some Q&A. So feel free to drop any questions you might have in our YouTube chat. Um, and the floor is yours. Feel free to introduce yourselves and the kind of work that you guys do. Ivan, you wanna go first? Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Ivan E. Debery and I am a creative producer, dramaturg and company manager. Um, I use all of all of the facets of my various things that I can do in my career um, really to to help um, support artists and give them platforms um, so that they feel supported. And this is mostly the people who are underproduced and underrepresented in the American theater. Those are my people and those are who I who I love to be around. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to my dear friend Rudy. Hi, uh, I'm Rudy Ramirez, and I am an associate artistic director of The Vortex, as well as a freelance director. I'm also starting my first uh, semester at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst for the MFA in directing. And uh, I am the artistic director of Avante Theater Project, which has our first artistic residency with Texas Performing Arts this year. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, and I'm, you know, first and foremost, a director and it's, it's the love, it's the passion. It's what I want to do all the time. Um, but, uh, being a director means you also have to be a producer quite often. And in particular, you know, I've, I've made it a big mission to produce new work in Austin. I was fortunate enough to be part of the, uh, of a, of a program at UT and there I get to know a number of playwrights both among the graduate students and the undergraduates and the professors. And uh, and then later on, I started uh, working to produce and curate Latinx work uh, through the Futurex Festival, which is entering its third year. And it will be online this year. We're very excited about what we get to put together. Sweet. I just love hearing about you. <laughs> likewise, likewise. I was just... Uh, in the chat, uh, telling that telling uh, Ivan that Hannah Sharif of uh, St. Louis Rep was talking about how she was such a big fan of the Parsnip Chip. I was like, well, I know I'm on, and we hang out, and it's like, yeah, whatever. We do hang out. We hang out um, in Austin. We've hung out in Brooklyn, and we've hung out in um, London. <laughs> in, I, right? Oh my God, we did hang out in London. National hangout friends, <laughs> like exactly. That's real. We're jet setters. We're jet setters. <laughs> Um, so how do we want to do this? I don't know. I mean, I think we're talking about uh, producing. All right. So I guess maybe one of the biggest questions is how on earth did we get started in all this? Where did this all begin for us? You know, I think I realized I wanted 
to be a producer. Well, let me go back. I I thought I wanted to be a director because I love 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 directors and what they what they bring to the the process. Um, um, <laughs> But then I, I realized at one point that I, I don't actually have patience to be in the rehearsal room or, you know, the, while the thing is while the thing is happening. Like, I want to be part of the thing happening, but I don't want to see it. Like, I'm going to leave it to people who it's that's their world and I'm going to trust them to to do it. Um, yeah, I felt like I had no patience for the rehearsal room um, and producing was like, oh, I could still tell people what to do but not be in the room, like a like a omnipresent voice or something. Um, and so at, I went to Brandeis University and I produced some things there through the undergraduate theater collective. Um, and then I was still again on this director track and eventually I realized like just putting things together was like what I wanted to do and where I wanted to live. I really wanted to live in the artistic world. I was not getting hired for internships or anything for that. So when the idea for starting Parsnip came about, that was when I was like, this is how I can flex producing skills. This is how I can actually dig into what it means to curate artists and a play and do a submissions and like really sink my teeth in because if American theater is not gonna give me an opportunity, you know, maybe purposefully so, you gotta make it for yourself. Um, and that's kind of where Parsnip, the, the love of Parsnip has, has grown and my skills in particular um, as a producer and how I've been challenged, I've mostly been through Parsnip and luckily have I've gotten other jobs for producing. Um, and so it's scaled up to, you know, understanding how to produce from indie theater all the way to commercial theater. I've not done commercial theater, but I do now have an understanding of it because of my previous experience. How about you, Boo? Um, so I started out my first professional directing thing was working with an anarchist uh, sustainable living community mm. in as Austin. One does. And, as one does. And they paid me $100 to direct a fundraiser for them. And they thought I was going to bring in a bunch of, of actors who I knew, but I didn't know any actors. I was just starting out. And so I said, well, let's, let's write this story together and let's produce this whole thing together. And and so I was very used to, at the beginning, uh, producing my own work, which came from, in college, doing club theater rather than department theater, where it was all of us figuring it out on our own in so many ways, um, with a, with, without people telling us, well, this is what you have to do. And so um, from there, uh, I, I did a lot of solo performance work and when I finally did start working at the Vortex, it was a sort of wonderful position where like, even I don't have to do this all myself. I don't have to raise all the money. I don't have to like, you know, figure out everything. This is great. This is yeah. this is wonderful. Um, but then I I started, it was really the Fluthorex Festival where I felt like I was wearing the producer hat as much as anything else because um, I was, you know, we had, we, we got some funding from the city of Austin, but I also had to do a lot of fundraising uh, on my own. And I thankfully found Raul Garza, who was amazing in terms of helping me do that. Um, and who put together so much amazing marketing material for it. And who is is, be, is such a huge part of how this festival is going to happen this year. Thank you, Raul, so much. Um, and, and what was, it really came from this desire to just get a bunch of people who I loved in one space, you know? Um, get a bunch of people who I love together uh, to showcase our art for one another and connect and get inspired and form collaborations that hadn't been happening up until that point. And it worked, it totally worked that first year. And, um, and I really, really value what happened because of it. And so I think that, um, that I've kept doing it because it feels so wonderful to know that you're bringing people together in that same room who, like you were saying before, who, who don't, who maybe don't get to be in the room at all, mm -hmm. you know, and, and making sure that, that, that there is a, 
uh, that even even within a Latinx theater festival, that even within that, there has to be diversity. You know, um, there has to be you know Afro Latinx perspectives. There have to be Indigenous perspectives. There have to be queer perspectives, feminist perspectives, um, all kinds of perspectives that um, because we're we're more than just one thing. And I think so often in the American theater, um, I think you know, people of color get invited into the room and it's just like, okay, you're gonna do this one thing, right? That's this, there's this, there's just one experience and you're gonna tell it to us. It's like, no, that's not how this works. Right. So letting it be something multiplicitous was just wonderful. Wonderful. I love that. I love that you um, really honed in on collaboration because I think, you know, I feel like the definition of producer has changed so much since like, you know, the 1950s white man trying to like get over, you know, and scam the the playwright out of royalties. Like, I don't, I don't do that. I don't even like to think about money as a producer, like, which is why I specifically say creative producer. I don't like fundraising. There are better producers who are well equipped at that. And I think also people need to understand there's a range of what producing is and that being a producer doesn't mean that you have to necessarily encapsulate all of these skills because it's that would be so hard <laughs> on one person to do it. Um, and so I always like to posit that I live in the creative nexus of generate generative work and artistry. Like that's what I want to produce. If I can figure out money, that's great. But I want to help you in your vision, get to what it needs. And that will make me satisfied. <laughs> that brings me so much joy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's about like being a connector, you know, being somebody who's like saying like, all right, you know, if, if there's a project you believe in, then, then part of that stewardship is saying, who are all the people that need to be in this room, exactly. you know, right now with this project. Exactly. Um, I am curious about the origins or the the uh, superhero origin story of the Parsnip Ship. Um, how did it become about, and uh, what what are the what's what is what's the the impetus for it, and those first few um, steps you took to get it off the ground. Um. The idea was co-conceived by my old uh, business partner who no longer is with Parsnip Ship. And the idea was really like we wanted to listen to plays and sit in a living room and drink and record it and make that a podcast. So it was really super simple, um, which, you know, if you listen to our first few episodes, it, it just changes in terms of like structure and format and um, length and like the random things we were testing out and, and trying to figure out um, when, you know, what like what is parsnip shit? What is the parsnip shit? So eventually that partner left and then I was like, okay. I'm the one steering the ship and I need to figure out where I want it to go <laughs> actually. Um, and, and it hit me at one point that if I'm gonna be using like my own money and resources and my team's money and resources that it, it Parsnip could not be something that replicated the inequities that exist on the American theater stage. Like it couldn't, like I as a black woman you know, who doesn't get paid a lot in American theater, probably, and I know I got paid less than my white counterparts in American theater. Like I, I, I felt like it'd be so inconscionable for me to put money into propping up more straight white cis men and having seasons full of them. Like if I'm gonna go broke and eat ramen while putting parsnip up, it's because I'm supporting queer people. It's because I'm, I'm supporting black and brown people. It's because I'm supporting women, point blank, period. And sometimes a straight cis white male playwright slips in there sometimes, but it's not the majority. <laughs> and it will never be the majority for parsnip. Um, and so once I had that as my anchor, as like, what am I going to like put my own money and my own resources in the kind, like 
it, it kind of was like a light bulb moment and everything kind of became clear. It was like, this is what you need to do. This is how you need to check yourself. This is um, how you need to step back or step up. Um, I've been learning that a lot. When do I need to jump in and when do I need to step back and like let an artist be an artist? Or when do I need to go, no, 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 come, 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 come here. You're going off course. Let's, let's, let's bring it back. <laughs> Um, and that was through Parsnip, that was through, you know, the other jobs I've held that really touch upon what being a producer is. And, you know, I, in my intro, I said I'm a company manager because I don't think a lot of people know what that is or why that is important in American theater. And um, I feel like company management has been the thing that has taught me the most about how to be a producer and how to care for people and how to make sure people feel safe because when people feel safe, they, they do their best. And that as a producer is what we should always be striving for is that our artists are bringing their best selves because we have done our best to create and cultivate environments for them. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, and I think that like, it's, it's, I think the fact you mentioned other jobs as well. Um, I certainly know that, you know, as a theater maker in Austin, you know, I mean, you have to hold a bunch of other different jobs, you know, to make theater happen. Um, and part of like my, my pursuit of an MFA is to try to like, can, can I, can I do only theater ish jobs to make my life happen? You know? Um, and, uh, and so I'm wondering, like, what were some of those other experiences that you had um, in various jobs, theater or otherwise, um, that, uh, you know, you talk about company management, but like other things that you've done that, that really helped inform your work on Parsnip Ship and help make it stronger? Yeah, I think that definitely company management really helped inform how I shifted and shaped parsnip ship. Um, I also think dramaturgy, being a dramaturg is helpful because parsnip, if people who are listening don't know, it is, you know, a, a radio pod play podcast. So it it's interesting doing something that is not a production. It's not a reading. It's not a concert. It's this weird hybrid of a thing. <laughs> it does not fit into a box. It's different every month. Like you have to start from scratch in a way every month with a new artist cultivating relationships. Um, and then, you know, in the, the submissions process, I'm reading hundreds of scripts and I have to read as I'm, as if I'm listening. <laughs> and, you know, I have to read not for what is to be seen because people aren't going to see this. I have to read for what is going to be heard and what is going to be experienced. And, that made me go, okay, I need to actually become a dramaturg. I didn't go to school for dramaturgy. And I sometimes still feel like a fraud as a dramaturg because I didn't go to school. And I'm, I know that's like supremacist thought. And I'm like letting that go because I know that I have read over probably 500 ways <laughs> at this point through submissions and through other things. I've been asked to like you know, read for and the just reading plays in general for fun. I know what a good play is. I know what a bad play is. I know when to put a play to the side. I know when a play is like, I can tweak it for audio and how to talk to the playwright about it. Um, yeah, I think that we, I think, you know, we're not leaning into us being dramaturgs more because it seems like such an academic thought and idea and like, it really, it is, but it isn't. It's it's just, you know, being smart and talking to playwrights like a smart person. I don't think I need to go spend $75,000 a year to know that. I mean, I will say that like, I think that, you know, I've had fantastic dramaturgs who didn't have any formal training. And like, I remember the, the, like, the first time someone like I, I hadn't really heard the term dramaturgy before my time at UT. And so I asked somebody just like, what's a dramaturg? You know, because like I really hadn't had a lot of formal theater training. And you know, they started describing what the dramaturg does. And I was like, well that's what a director does. Well that's what a director does. Well that's what a director does. And I was like, 
how is a dramaturg not a director? And as I as I began to understand more what was going on, I really thought about how dramaturgy as a concept is basically like it's 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 the research and the critical thought that goes into making theater. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have to bring that without without exception. Right. So right. We are all dramaturgs. And I think there's something important about, you know, empowering designers, actors, everyone in the process to be dramaturgs that makes for really successful shows. Right. Everyone that that is something we all need to lean in, especially, you know, when theater when we can gather again and theater is back in its full production form. I think this is the moment, the slowdown moment is learn how to be the dramaturg you would need in the room. Like this is a time if you've been putting off reading a play or reading off, you know, something academic about a playwright or, you know, looking up costumes from another period. Like it's so, you can be so randomly specific about what you can bring to the table. Even watching television is dramaturgy. I use so many TV references for dramaturgy because younger playwrights understand that than something, I'm not gonna like reference Chekhov. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care for Arthur Miller. I don't care. But I will reference, yeah, there was this um, living single episode. It's episode this and this. This is what I thought about your play. This is what I liked about the scene. This is what I like. This is what I suggest you might want to look at. Here is this music video I saw. You know, here is this song I listened to. There are so many ways to, in multimedia, to tap into being a dramaturg that isn't rested upon dead old white men. Agreed. I think we need that, that we need to understand the theatrical works we create in the context of a larger cultural world. Because that's what we're programming. Right? We're, Theater is for the culture. So we always have to be connecting the culture to how we talk about theater. Absolutely, uh, you know, and and as someone who works so often with young people, you know, at, uh, like at the high school level, at the college level now, um, I, I am so grateful for the ways in which they're informing me about what is the new thing, what is happening, what are the new references? What are the shows they're watching? What is the music listening to? And and particularly that that you know, as as Generation Z comes into their own, as the bunch of of anti capitalist radicals that they are, I adore Generation Z. Um, I think we're going to get some really beautiful work coming out of that if um, if the American theater is like, as you said, taking this moment of pause to say, let's open, let's open up, and let's think long-term, you know? Exactly, exactly. I think about Gen Z and, um, you know, are we, as a millennial, I'm like, I'm 29, so it's not even like I'm an older millennial, but I, I'm kind of like, are we, are they prepped for like, producing in this new age, which, you know, it's it's come at an interesting time for them in a time where everything stopped and then everyone turned to technology, which um, was really, really interesting um, and uh, a little bit uh, overwhelming. I know for me, it was a little overwhelming to have everyone suddenly start to go, oh, audio theater. And it was like, Everyone before now was saying that wasn't real theater. Like I got that a lot for Parsnip Ship. Like it's not real theater because it exists as a podcast. And like, why, why is that the, why is that the case? Like, why is it that my theater company can reach people in other countries? It bridges borders. Like we have people listening in Hong Kong, in India. I get emails from people from different parts of the world. And it's so like, I should know that that's what's gonna happen, but it's so surprising to me. And then I tell that to theaters and they're like, oh, like we don't, they don't get that, that like that concept doesn't, is, is not connected for them until they pivoted into this digital space. And we see things like TikTok and everyone's doing digital content. 
And now like the concept of theater has changed. It's no longer relegated to the stage. It's, I, I've been saying theater now needs to be constituted as an experience. Um, and I think once we pivot towards that kind of thinking, you know, the unions will get their act together, hopefully, <laughs> you know, so that they can support the people in their unions. Um, you know, we can create a financial model that's more sustainable and more people can work more often. There's probably hopefully going to be less competition for um, productions or being part of content that, or theatrical co content specifically. I think this just cracks up, just opens up many things. And I think Gen Z, with all the technology that is yet to come, they're gonna be so poised at this point because they're not the ones in power yet, but like they're seeing like, they're, they're, they're at a really good place now to kind of learn how to start to take the reins. Yeah, I when the quarantine began, you know, I, I had the, I spent last year working, well, the, the year before, working on a piece about extinction. And the thing about extinction is that when, when, when the asteroid hits, it's all the big animals that die off. Yes. You know, like, it's like the dinosaurs are the ones who are gone, you know. It's the little birds and little mammals that survive and then take over afterwards. And I think that we're going to be in a moment where... I think we're going to see some major institutions really falter, and um, that does like for the young producers out there watching this, or people who are interested in doing it someday. Like now's your moment, you know. Like if you can, if you can come in dynamic and figure out how to integrate, you know, whatever live performance you're doing, like in face to face with digital elements, online elements, whether they're interactive, whether they're pre-recorded, whatever it may be. If you're thinking about like, I need to make art across multiple platforms and understand the interconnectivity of those platforms, you are going to come out of this whole thing in, in a very good position provided like we don't all die in some sort of horrifying like <laughs> coup pandemic like terrorist situation. Oh, no. um, crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. And and my friend Eva, who was in last the Extinction show, uh, is sending her love. And <laughs> I love you. Mwah. Mira que nice, que nice. Um, but yeah, so um and I think that's like I know that one of the things that we they we were asked to do is sort of like talk about like what are the tips and tricks? And I think about like what are what are some of the the things that we would be that that either we wish we knew or that we would want to like tell the people who are also starting out on this producerial journey, um, which like you know I'm still like very sort of just like I've gone like you know maybe like two miles like in like a thousand mile journey it feels like uh, so um, but yeah I'm wondering like what are some of the things that you um, that whenever whenever people are asking well well how do I do this this is like your go-to things? Yeah, I would say that you need to find your people. You just need to find, you know, and your people can be the people you directly work with to produce something um, or slash and, or slash and <laughs> your community of like who you are producing to or producing for, I should say. Um, you gotta find your people. I will say for Parsnip, I like do not do parsnip by myself. I know I'm like the face and voice and yada, yada, yada of it, but I do not do it by myself. I have an incredible team behind me who is like, constant, they're so smart working on it. Can I can vent to them? Because we like to say like none of us are an island. And I think as a producer, it can sometimes feel like you have the world, the weight of the world on your shoulders. It's not the weight of the world. It is literally this one show. <laughs> so first of all, remember that because also if no one dies, it's fine. Like it's either gonna be okay or everyone dies. Like those are the extremes. So like, just remember it's a show and that if you have your people, it's much easier to do the thing. It's so much easier to do the thing. I cannot over, um, 
I can't overemphasize communication. Like just just always communicating with people. Parsnip, as soon as I know who the playwrights are and I've programmed them, I like email them. I'm like, let's get coffee, let's get drinks, let's hang out so that we can like get to know each other as people. Like, cause really in the end, people. We are people, we are people, we are people. And if we're all competent people, there's always a solution. And there's never really a reason for things to get super stressful or negative if you're always communicating. So like, those are the things I would suggest, like find your people, always communicate. And you are not an island. Absolutely. I, I will say the flip side of this though, is that like, you gotta be prepared to pick up whatever plate someone else drops. True. True, 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 true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was that that like uh, post I was seeing on Facebook about like plastic balls and glass balls. And I read that where it's like some some of the balls you have in your world are glass. And if they fall, they break and like there's ripple effects. And then there are plastic ones that if you drop, they just bounce back up like they're good. I saw that and I was like, Wow, way to read me. <laughs> and because if you're a producer mo um, balancing multiple projects, which is, you know, once you get to do that, you're really a project manager and project planner. And so I usually have like seven projects and like, it's like all of them are in various stages of development and moving through some kind of pipeline. And so, yeah, it's always a negotiation of like, if I don't do this thing, this is a glass ball and it will break and it might cause me more issues later. And so sometimes as a producer, that's also your job. You gotta, you gotta do it. Like that is your, your role. Your job is to make sure it gets done. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, that, you know, I think that, that uh, what I love what you said is that your people aren't just the, you know, logistical support or the labor support, they're the emotional support as well. Oh, like, yeah. you know, I think that it, it makes a difference if you're fighting for someone, you know? Yeah. When, like, you know, when when you are, when you're stressing out, like, I mean, I think that if, if you know, it's, it's why I'm not like, you know, I thought at one point I might be a solo performer, but I just don't have it in me to like do that much work just to like do my own art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so like, it's, you know, but, but the, the collaborative nature of theater, the collaborative nature of directing and producing are such that I was like, people depend on me and like, I've, I, I have their trust. I've earned their trust and to continue to earn their trust. I need to make sure that whatever has got to happen has got to happen. Yeah. And, you know, and then at the same time, like making sure you have people who, you know, support you through it and who are able to you know, to jump in and say, okay, I got this glass ball right here. Yeah. You know, um, if necessary. Um, but just like, I always say that, that, I mean, you know, you never know when disaster will strike. And I have been there when disaster has struck. Uh, so, so that's something to, uh, to always bear in mind is that, that um, as a producer, you know, you can't sort of say it's like, well, something happened and like, I know it was out of my control. It's like, it's like, no, like, it's like, it's, you ultimately chose at one point whether to like say, I'm going to fix it or I'm going to just let this glass ball break. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's a big part of it as well. Yeah. And what, another thing you just said, trust, trust is so important. That's why you need to find your people because like theater just in general just doesn't work if there's no trust. Yeah. So you need that as a producer. Yeah. Um, and so because uh, Spum posted a question where she uh, said, like, how do you start building your network of collaborators for a project? And, you know, I think to me, like, it, it's, you know, I started out, you know, as an actor, I started out like acting in shows. And most of all, I started out going to a lot of shows. You know, it's it's this thing where, you know, I mean, I have often been asked the question of like, of, of, of how do you have such diverse casts and how do you like find all these actors of color to be in your shows? I'm just like, I go to shows. Um, it's a question that I often find like very aggravating because it's just like, you know, I'll, I want to ask the person like, well, have you gone to see shows by Latinx or African-American theater companies? You know, 
have you gone to improv shows? Mm -hmm. Are anything there? And I think that you need to, that building your network is about um, consuming art with enthusiasm and staying afterwards, even just for those few minutes to just like say to that actor or meet that writer or, or meet that designer and say this like, hey, I love what you do and I would love to work with you one day. And, and that, that's often enough. And, and then once you start working with people, making sure you are, you know, if you are on time, good at what you do and good to work with, you're gold. Um, cause, cause there's a lot of people who are not those three things. Uh, so I think it's, it's important to, to begin building your network with that humility and, and a real love for what other people do. And if you like find the people who are like, wow, I love what you do. They might wind up loving what you do back because you have that shared aesthetic connection and they become your collaborators. Yeah, that's so true. Going to shows, super important, um, especially going to shows in as many places as you can in many theater companies. Um, I mean, I live in New York and I work at the public. And so that's like my downtown <laughs> theater spot. And then I can go uptown and there's another section, you know, because New York is so big that I know not everyone who goes, who lives in Harlem is going to come see something in Brooklyn. That's just like, a really hard sell like and I don't really go see things in Harlem um and so but sometimes I know I have to if I want to continue to cultivate and create a community um that I can call my people um I also think that you can't over you can't you know can't overestimate being kind because <laughs> people remember kindness right like we, we are we're hearing a lot of um horrific traumatizing stories of people in theater and like that really sticks with people like people you know like you feel that years and years later and you know it's the it's you know i can't remember who said the quote but you you'll forget what people said but you'll remember how they made you feel um i believe it's maya angelo um i might be wrong about that but uh all to say that you can't under you can't overestimate being kind in in theater right like you you can't so i think that is also part of building your network of collaborators because what if one person thinks you're dope and chill and awesome to work with they're probably going to recommend you or connect you with someone else and that is how it grows and it grows um for parsnip i've met um people in my community because they stayed after like you said and they've come up to me and gone this was really cool I would love to join and like I put them on the name to be an actor and then if I can call them later to be an actor that's great like it just it's so it can be so simple um yeah but be kind <laughs> and I, I'll tell you like uh, I, I don't know if I've ever said this uh but you know I I uh for those at home um, I met Ivan uh, working on uh, Annie Jump and the Library of Heaven by Raina Hardy uh, for the Parsnip ship. And, um, you know, and I, I went up to New York to direct it. And, you know, and, and I thought, you know, like I'm, I'm an Austin director. I thought, gosh, like I, I, I hope that I, I hope I come across well. I hope I don't come across as like something more than like someone like rocking back and forth in my clown shoes. Um, and, and I remember that like, uh, uh, one of the actors, Angel Lynn, um, she uh, and she's been in like national tours of like shows, and she's and she's like she's like a voiceover on a Netflix cartoon right now. Uh, and she, uh, I know, and so she said, she said to me, you know, like, I, like this is this coming to this rehearsal has been my favorite part of my week, uh, this week, and it was just, and it was so lovely and then you and the other partnership shows folks were just so like wow it's so great to work with you yeah and i was yeah. like, yeah. like yeah. yeah. are you okay are you good, are you good? <laughs> and and it was something that like it really was one of the things that gave me the confidence to start thinking wow like if i can go to new york and make a good impression on folks then i can do this outside of austin 
you know, I can, and, and, you know, getting that kind of feedback from folks, it's very easy, particularly in Austin, where, you know, we're, we're sort of, you know, in the middle of the country, we're kind of on our own, like, and because, you know, the, the, the nearest, you know, like, I mean, Houston is two hours away, uh, San Antonio is closest, but, um, you know, but it's, it's very easy for us to be in a bubble and to sort of only know how we are in this little bubble. And so to hear from people outside the bubble, like you're good at what you do and we like working with you is such an amazing thing. So that's another thing is, is you know, take the risk to sort of like expand your network outside of your hometown. You never know what it's gonna yield. Yeah, you never know. And I also will say like, it's important to keep learning um, in terms of becoming a producer and expanding your network. Uh, I still, you know, I will see a class about something like, you know, producing uh, in a pandemic or something random. I, I know how to produce, but especially in these Zoom rooms, I feel like networks have like exploded even more in the last several months because now I can log in and I can see and meet someone from LA and, you know, they'll see my name and they're like, oh my God, I love Parson, but I'm like, I have heard of your theater company. We should talk. We should grab virtual drinks or something. I've started to make so many of these connections and kind of enjoy the Zoom process as I like have learned to not have it be this time suck, but how can I actually connect with people in a way that I'm not always looking for someone for a, a collaborator for a specific thing. It's just sometimes good to know people. Sometimes, sometimes good to just go on like, date with other theater people, other producers. I've been taking this time to talk a lot more with other producers because it's not an island. And I keep finding specifically more black women producers. I hear of a new one and I'm like, hi, you don't know me. I heard of you. I'm another black female producer in New York. I'd love to like get to know you. And I've had many meetings like that. And I don't necessarily need to hit up these producers. You know, we all do radically different things, but there might be a point where we might want to collaborate. There might be a point where I have something that I can't manage and I can pass it off to them um, as a project that they can produce. I've had um, other producer friends send me job stuff, especially in the middle of a pandemic to be able to still be employed because people are like, we want to work with you. I thought of you, here's this job. Like, Again, you can't underestimate or overestimate. I keep saying underestimate. You can't overestimate, you know, being forthcoming, being kind, and also just like, yeah, being open. Absolutely. Um, another question that was that we got in the mm -hmm. chat is, um, I think these these two things sort of go together. Though, what inspires you about the projects you choose to produce, and what is the most important part of producing to you? So like where does what are, what are the 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 central passions that like make you say like all right this is something I want to take the time and take the energy to do and then in the process of doing it what's what are the what's the biggest priorities? Mm, that's a good one. I think I think that there's kind of like a not a difference or necessarily a line, but between the ones that I help generate, the projects that I'm helping generate versus ones that I'm hired for. Now, the ones I'm generating, I like spend hours on it, not get paid, like love it, really just wanna do it for the love of, versus the ones where someone is like, we wanna hire you and pay you X amount of dollars to produce this thing. Now, when it comes to being paid, that helps entice it, but that's not the end all be all for me. <laughs> Because I've learned that if I don't like what I'm working on, it's a really miserable experience. And then I wish I hadn't had said yes. Like I've I've learned I've I've learned to internalize that. And so now when I do get offered producing projects, it's like I have to ask myself, is this something fun? Who are the artists involved? How much agency do I have and autonomy do I have? Is the money worth it? Or if it's not paid, is it a great love of? And then the biggest thing is like, how does it challenge me? Because I don't like to sit on my laurels as a as a producer, like Parsnip, for example, 
we can produce parsnip like the back of our hand before the pandemic. It's going to be different now. <laughs> but the back of our hand, we could be like, oh, yeah, in three, four weeks, we could do a pars uh, create a parsnip episode out of thin air. Easy peasy. Um, now, like, and now when I look at the one, the, the, the jobs I am asked and people are offering me money for, it's like, do I want to work with these people? What is the mission and vision and values of this organization? Is this a project where I'm actually going to learn something? Is it a project if I mess up that I'm going to be fired and let go? Do I have to be perfect already going into this? Because I'm not going to be. It's always a learning curve when you're you're um, producing something, especially something that someone has already created and are, is giving you to shepherd to like the end iteration. That that can be you know you're not gonna get you're not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be perfect. I wasn't there at the beginning, so I don't know what this show is. I have to figure it out as I work on it, and I'm gonna make mistakes, and you're gonna be okay with that. And if you're not, then this is not the job for me to take. So. Yeah, I think those are those are the things that I think about. But in the terms of the projects I generate, yeah, for me, it's like it can't be whites to straight men. I just don't I don't really do that. Like they have many opportunities and many spaces. Me, Parsnip's probably one of the last on that list for them. <laughs> How about you? What what sparks joy for you? Oh gosh, that's a great condo <laughs> question. Uh, so, um, well, I will say that what he said, like my, my uh, this, uh, director in Chicago, Jess Hutchinson, once I said, uh, there, there are three reasons to do a show, the money, the script and the people, and you need at least two. And I really took that to heart um, because I think- for me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and I, and I mean, and that's, that's the thing is that like, is that, you know, I, fortunately, I don't think I've ever been in a situation where, you know, I had, you know, a lot of money and a great script, but the people were terrible, um, you know, and I feel like what, what really, you, you know, there's, I, I was, I had to do this actually for my class um, uh, on text analysis is sort of like, how do you begin analyzing the play? And I think there's this, always a moment when I, when I'm reading something and, I find what I call the heart, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's it's this it's this sort of moment where a core emotional value of the play is revealed, and if it syncs up with my values, then I'm just like, okay, I'm really into this one, you know, and it's come in a lot of different forms in a lot of different plays. Um, sometimes it's even just a stage direction, but there's that that's it's you know it gets in and because there's so often such a long process, it becomes a question of like, well, what just stays in my head long enough? Right. You know, what? what is not gonna let itself like leave my heart, you know? And and some, and some a lot of that is based on collaborators and people who I wanna work with. Um, other things are based on, um, on again, just like reading a script and being like, gosh, this thing is so great and I really wanna put this on stage someday. Um, and it's hard to predict what exactly it's going to be. Um, but there's a lot of shows where I've loved them so much that like, even if maybe the Vortex doesn't want to go do them, I'll, I'll, I'll take some other theater companies because mm -hmm. uh, I'm just like, really want to fight to make it happen. Um, and, and I think it's, it's the same thing with producing the festival is that like, you know, I, I'll reach out to people and they'll pitch an idea. And there's this one moment where I'm like, ah, oh, this idea, it needs to happen. We need to see it, we need to do this. We need to put it in conversation. And um, and it, it really, it, I think there is, there's, you know, it's such a facile thing in so many ways, but it doesn't make it untrue that, you know, passion speaks to passion, Yep. you know? Yep. So if someone is coming to me with passion, then I'm much more likely to be like, oh, tell me more, you know? Uh, and, um, and I think also that, that, you know, if people come to you with a sense of knowing who, who you are, you know, like I've, I've had some people approach me in ways that felt like you've heard some things about me, but you don't actually know me though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I don't have time for that. Um, 
Whereas if there's a deeper understanding of what my goals are, what my work is, then I'm like, all right, we're gonna be down. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. No, that's so true. I mean, and like you brought up amazing word, which is passion. Like you have to have passion to be a producer. It is not for the faint of heart. Not everyone can be a producer. <laughs> like people are so surprised when I'm like, yeah, I produce and I love it. They're like, what? <laughs> but I don't always, and this is not to say I love it like every day of every minute. No, like it's it, like, that's impossible. There are, there are days like even yesterday where I was just like, oh, I have been on a computer for like 12 hours. And like, you know, sometimes being a producer just means you're on email and you're, or you're texting or like, you're just like in a screen. And I, <laughs> I don't always love that, but it is part of like, getting the thing done. And I always have to remember, I have to tap into the passion of like, why do I love it? Why do I love the career that I'm, I'm hobbling together? <laughs> um, it's because I have such a deep, unexplainable passion for theater that, you know, it, it escapes my family. Even my mother today was like, why didn't you become a nurse? And I was like, I don't like people like that, but I do, <laughs> I do. <laughs> just not just just like just theater is it theater is like what i feel married to and um i've never been married but i assume you have to get up and fight for the thing and like sometimes you don't like your other person sometimes you want to break and i i also take breaks from theater and from producing sometimes i i go like i'm gonna take a week off because you get you can get burnt out when you are organizing so many things and sometimes it's hard to organize your life that sometimes you do get burnt out and it's okay to step away for a week, two weeks, a month, whatever length of time you need to reset and come back and realize. And when you get back into it, go like, I, I love this. I miss this. I miss the, the whizzing of a hundred emails a day and going like, that's not right. This is right. Let's move this forward. Sometimes you just need a, I, the other tip I say is sometimes step away. That's okay. And we need to normalize okay. that, that it's okay to step away and that we don't need to burn out or kill ourselves for, for theater. Yeah. Especially now, especially now. Yeah. I mean, I uh, like, on the one hand, you know, when the quarantine started, I was just like, I need to do theater of some kind or some kind of art performance, or I will go oh, completely insane. Uh, oh, but at the same time, you know, I've, again, I, I think that we, we, like I was saying before, we have the opportunity to do <clears throat> some nice, long, slow cooks, you know, to do uh, some, uh, to, to uh, be like, all right, we're going to, we're going to put the brisket in the smoker and going to set it on there for like, overnight yeah. and tomorrow yeah. it's going to be amazing um and you know because i think that we in theater are so used to this really rapid turnover really quickly doing things we're like the next project the next project the next project next project and so um to say like all right i truly don't know when the next project is going to be what if i take that time to make the exact project that i want and i think that that people who you know, want to produce, you have the time now to say, all right, I'm going to choose really carefully and take the time to make it really awesome. So like I, I had this hugely fortunate opportunity to get this um, residency with Texas Performing Arts. And I was like, wow, there's this project I've wanted to do for, for like a while now. I want to adapt Lorca's Rural Trilogy with uh, like, and make them really absurd queer Mexican comedies. And I got some people to work on those things with me. And and what was great was, you know, Fusebox and Texas Performing Arts who together put together the um the the residency, you know, they've been they, they really said it's just like, well, like, you know, we can't produce a show right now. Take your time, you know, take your time. And and the other thing we decided to do, which I'm really excited about, was to um, oh, and you should host some of these. Of course you should. Um, and so um, I love these moments. Um, 
uh, to really open up our process and have like, little just like have some of our meetings be like open broadcast Zoom meetings where people can like see how we're putting these plays together. And, you know, they can also like, you know, add their comments, add their questions. We can bring in dramaturgs, bring in people mm -hmm. who can who can talk about the the, the like Lorca or, or theater in Mexico and Texas or other things we're interested in and really sort of document this creation process as its own piece of art. Yes. Um, and that to me is very exciting because it says like, all right, you know, we still want to create shows that are in person, live, you know, hopefully at a point where we will not need masks in the same way, all right. those things are true. But in the meantime, we can look at process and say the process itself is a work of art that people can look at and respond to. Yes, process is, oh, Rudy, we can talk about this for so long, but yes, yes, yes to process, to longer processes um, during this time where things are slow. So why not just go slow with like, you know, there's no rush. There's no, there's no rush. I think that the, the, I, the need and idea of, of rushing to create and put out content has finally slowed down. <laughs> like it was so overwhelming in April. I was like, I, how am I quadruple booked for Zoom on a Wednesday? What? I'm very happy that things have slowed down and, um, we're being just more conscientious about our time and what we want to consume and how we want to consume it. But I am also really happy that things um, are more accessible in ways to the to the people who really do need theater and do need culture. The fact that we can bring it to them means that we could have always brought it to them. I mean, that's why Parsnip is free and it's accessible. It's like, I, I don't want to deny someone listening to something that may, you know, could change their life or be revolutionary to their being and how they develop and how they see things. Um, and that's what theater is supposed to do. And so if we can continue to create more models that create a sustainable method and way in which we're doing that and continuing to like cultivate our people, like our theater, our, our industry can come back. So amazing and, you know, one that I think, you know, newer producers, like younger producers, like I think we we understand and like that's what we want. We just need people to like really help us and reaffirm that that is, that is the way we wanna go. I'm happy to go that way. I need, <laughs> I need other people to like tell me that they're not okay spending $300 to see a show, <laughs> you know, when $300 you could see a show, get a night out, um, a dinner, but also support a BIPOC theater company who would love $200 donation. It's so much more. Absolutely. Um, so I think we're about out of time. So um, I'll, I will say thank you so much to Simone Raquel Alexander, um, the producer and director of uh, New Manifest for having us. And, uh, oh, it has been amazing to have you guys both here. I appreciate both of your work so much. And that's why I obviously wanted you guys as part of this producing workshop, because I think people should know about your work. They should know how to, you know, get out there and produce the work. I think it's so important to give artists those tools and know that, you know, if you're passionate about it and, and you want to get out there and do it, the world is your oyster and you totally can. And I think you guys are brilliant examples of artists truly doing the work right now. So thank you so much for being a part of this panel. It's been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank, thank you, you. So and thank you, Rudy. I like, I love you. Everyone just, I just want to say, I love, I love them. I love Rudy so, so much. Um, yeah, I just love to see your face. I'm going to stop. Now. I know, me so happy. And your hair is amazing also. Your hair is so amazing yeah. right now. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you.